Chapter Fifteen of Agincourt, a Romance by George Payne Rainsford James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim. One morning, while the events which I have lately detailed were passing in the city of London, a man in a long brown gown, with a staff in his hand, a cross upon his shoulder, and a cockle shell in his hat, walked slowly and apparently wearily into the little village of Abbot's Anne and sat himself down on a stone bench before the reeve's door recognising the pilgrim from some far distant land as she looked out of her casement window the good dame with the charitable spirit of the age took him forth some broken victuals and a cup of ale and inquired what news he brought from over sea the wanderer however seemed more inclined to ask than answer questions and was apparently full of wonder and amazement at the tragic story which he had just heard he said of the death of the lady catherine beecham he prayed the good woman for love and for charity's sake to tell him all about it and she very willing to gratify him for every country gossip gains dignity while telling a horrible tale began at the beginning of the affair as far as she knew it and related how just on the night after the last glutton mass as child richard of woodville their lord's nephew was riding down the road with a friend he heard a shriek and on hurrying to the water found the body of the poor young lady floating down the stream how the two gentlemen bore her to the chanter's cottage and how marks were found upon her person which seemed to prove that she had come to her death by unfair means and has the murderer been discovered sister inquired the old pilgrim alas no replied the reeve's wife there have been whispers about but nothing certain ay murder will out sooner or later answered the pilgrim and whom did the whispers point at nay replied dame julian i know not that i ought to say but to a reverend man like you who have visited the shrine of st james there can be no harm in speaking of these things especially as we all know that the whispers are false well then but you must tell nobody what i say the lady's own lover husband indeed i might call him for they were betrothed by holy church has been accused of having done the deed but every one who knows sir harry dacre is right sure that he would have sooner cut off both his hands and besides the miller of clapford mill told me it was but yesterday morning that half an hour before sunset on that very day when all this happened he saw sir harry at his own place and opened the gate for him to go through he remembered it he said because the knight had torn his hand with a nail in the gate by trying to open it without dismounting and as soon as he was through he rode on towards way hill which is quite away from here might he not have come back again by another road asked the pilgrim no answered dame julian not without going four miles round and besides the miller told me that his man job saw the knight half an hour later at the top of way hill halting his horse and gazing at the sun setting now that's a good way off and this deed was done just after close of day then that clears him replied the pilgrim but is there no one else suspected the good woman shook her head, and he added, "'Was nobody seen about here who might have cause to wish the lady ill?' "'None,' said Dame Julian, with a low laugh, "'but one who might perhaps wish her dead, for he got all her wealth, which was prodigious, they say.' "'Aye, was he seen about then?' demanded the pilgrim. "'There might be suspicion there.' "'Why,' said the reeve's wife, "'he was staying up at the hall and passed homeward about three it might be a little later but not much what became of him afterwards i do not know and yet now i think of it he must have remained in the place some time for he was seen an hour after or more by a girl who asked me who he was tis a wonder she did not know him said the pilgrim if she lives in this place but that she does not answered dame julian she dwells a good way off and was here by chance Ah, it is a sad tale indeed rejoined her companion but i must go good dame gramercy for your bounty but tell me i saw an abbey as i came along have they any famous relics there ay that they have rejoined the reeve's wife with a look of pride our abbey is as rich in relics as any other in england 
and she began an enumeration of all the valuable things that it contained, amongst which the objects that she seemed to set the greatest store by was a finger of St. Luke the Evangelist, the veil of the Blessed Virgin, and one of the ribs of St. Ursula. The pilgrim declared that he must positively go and visit them, as he never passed any holy relics without sanctifying himself by their touch. He accordingly took his way towards the abbey direct, and visited and prayed at the several shrines which the church contained, having secured the company and guidance of one of the monks, who were always extremely civil and kind to pilgrims and palmers, when they did not come exactly in the guise of beggars. The present pilgrim was of a far different quality, and he completely won the good graces and admiration of, of the attendant monk, not so much, indeed, by the devotion with which he told his beads and repeated his prayers, as by his generosity in laying down a large piece of silver before the rib of St. Ursula, another at the shrine of St. Luke, and a small piece of gold opposite to the veil of the Blessed Virgin. Having thus prepared the way, the stranger proceeded to open a conversation with the monk, somewhat similar to that which he had held with Dame Julian, the reeve's wife, and now a torrent of information flowed in upon him, for his companion had been one of the brethren who accompanied the abbot to the cottage whither the body of Catherine Beecham had been carried. The tale, however, though told with much loquacity, furnished but few particulars beyond those which the pilgrim had already gained, for the monk appeared a meek, good man, who took everything as he found it, and deduced but little from anything that he heard. All that he knew, indeed, he was ready to tell, but he had neither readiness nor penetration sufficient to gather much information, or to sift the corn from the chaff. The pilgrim seemed somewhat disappointed, for he was certainly anxious to hear more, and he was on the eve of leaving the church unsatisfied, when he beheld another monk pacing the opposite aisle, with a grave and even dull air. He was an old man, with a short, thin, white beard, and heavy features, which, till one examined closely, gave an expression of stupidity to his whole countenance, only relieved by the small, elephant-like eye, which sparkled brightly under its shaggy eyebrow. "'What brother is that?' demanded the pilgrim, looking across the church. "'Oh, that is Brother Martin,' replied the monk, "'a dull and silent man, from whom you will get nothing. He is skilled in drugs and medicines, it is true. His cell is like an alchemist's shop.' but we all think he must have committed some great sin in days of old, for half his time is spent in prayers and penances, and the other half in distilling liquors, or roasting lumps of clay and other stuffs in crucibles and furnaces. Tis rather hard, the Lord Abbot favours him so much, and has granted him two cells, the best in the whole monastery, to follow these vain studies, which, in my mind, come near to magic and sorcery. I saw him once, with my own eyes, make a piece of paper cut in the shape of a man, dance upright as if it had life. "'I will speak to him,' said the pilgrim, "'and will soon let you know if there be anything forbidden in his studies, "'for I have been in lands full of witches and sorcerers, "'and have learnt to discover them in an instant.' "'Tis a marvel if he answers you at all,' replied the monk, "'for he's as silent as a frog. "'But I pray you, let me hear what you think of him. Aye, that I will, rejoined the stranger, but you must keep away while we talk together, lest the presence of another might close his lips. I will seek you out afterwards, brother. I think your name is Clement, so the porter told me. The same, the same, replied the monk. I will go to the refectory. But before he went, he paused for a minute or two and watched the pilgrim crossing the nave and addressing brother Martin. At first he seemed to receive no answer but a monosyllable. The next instant, however, much to his surprise, Clement saw the silent brother turn round, gaze intently upon the pilgrim's face, and then enter into an eager conversation with him. What was the subject of which they spoke he could not divine, or rather, what was the secret by which the pilgrim had contrived to break the charmed taciturnity of silent brother Martin, and his curiosity was so much excited that he thought fit to cross over also, though with a slow and solemn step, in order to benefit by this rare accident. The small, clear, grey eye of Brother Martin, however, caught Clement's movements in a moment, and laying his hand upon the sleeve of the pilgrim's gown, he led him, with a quick step, through a small side door, 
that opened into the cloister and thence to his own cell leaving the inquisitive monk who did not choose to discompose his dignity or shake his fat sides by rapid motion behind them in the church what turn their communications took and whether the pilgrim discovered or not that brother martin was addicted to the black art clement never learned for the faithless visitor of the abbey totally forgot to fulfil his promise and when at the end of about two hours he took his departure it was by the back door leading from the cloister over the fields the high road was at no great distance and along it he trudged with a much more light and active step than that which had borne him into the village on his first appearance so that had good dame julian the reeve's wife seen him as he went back she might have been inclined to think that brother martin had employed upon him some magical device to change age into youth about half a mile from andover the pilgrim turned a little from the road and sitting down in a neighbouring field took out of his wallet a large kerchief and an ordinary hood then stripped off his brown gown and hat laying them directly in the kerchief and next divested himself of a quantity of white hair which left him with a shock head of a lightish brown hue a short tabard of blue cloth a stout pair of riding boots and a dagger in his girdle so ends my pilgrimage said ned dyram as he packed up his disguise in the napkin and by my faith i have brought home my wallet well stored out upon it am i to labour thus always for others no by my faith i will at least keep some of the crusts i have got for myself and if others want them they must pay for them let me see we will divide them fairly dame julian and brother clement in one lot brother martin in the other that will do and if aught be said about it hereafter i will speak the truth and avow that had i been paid i would have spoken alchemy is a great thing without its aid i could never have transmuted brother martin's leaden silence into such golden loquacity why i have taught the old man more in an hour than he has learned in his life before and he has given wheat for rye so that we are even with these sage reflections ned dyram put his packet under his arm and walked on to andover where at a little hostelry by the side of the river he paused and called for his horse which was soon brought a cup of ale sufficed him for refreshment and after he had drained it to the dregs he trotted off upon the road to london still meditating over all that he had learned at abbot's anne and dunbury abbey and somewhat hesitating as to the course which he had to pursue it would afford little either of instruction or amusement were i to trace all the reflections of a cunning but wayward mind for such was that of edward dyram naturally possessed of considerable abilities quick in acquirements retentive in memory keen observing dexterous he might have risen to wealth and perhaps distinction for his were not talents of that kind which led some of the best scholars of that day to beg from door to door with a certificate of their profound science from the chancellors of their universities but of a much more serviceable and worthy kind a certain degree of waywardness of mind and inconstancy of disposition often approaching that touch of insanity which affected or was affected by those wise men the court fools of almost all epochs and an unscrupulousness in matters of principle which left his conduct often in very doubtful balance between honesty and knavery had barred his advancement in all the many walks he had tried he had strong and even ungovernable animal impulses also which had more than once led him into situations of difficulty and between which and his natural ambition there was the same struggle that frequently took place between his good sense and his folly he laboured hard not perhaps to govern his passions but rather to keep their gratification within safe limits and he felt a sort of ill-will towards himself when they overcame him which generated a cynical bitterness towards others that bitterness was also increased by a consciousness of not having succeeded in any cause as much as the talents he knew himself to possess might have ensured but it must not be supposed that for one moment that ned dyram ever attributed the failure of his efforts for advancement to himself the injustice or folly of others he thought or the concurrence of untoward circumstances had alone kept him in an inferior situation 
though the king on his accession to the throne had extended to him greater favour than to any other of those who had participated in the wild exploits of his youth simply because ned dyram had never prompted or led in any unjustifiable act and had not withheld the bitterness of his tongue even from the youthful follies of the prince yet he felt a rankling disappointment at not having been promoted and honoured without ever suspecting that henry might have seen in him faults or failings that would have rendered him a more dangerous servant to a sovereign than to a private individual yet such was the case for that great prince's eyes were clear-sighted and keen and though he had not troubled himself to study all the intricacies of the man's character he had perceived many qualities which he believed might be amended by mingling with the world in an inferior station which unfitted the possessor at the time for close attendance upon the monarch ned thyram however though affecting that bluntness which is so often mistaken for sincerity was not without sufficient pliancy to conceal his mortification and to perform eagerly whatever task the king imposed upon him i do not say indeed that he proposed to perform it well unless it suited his own views and wishes he did the monarch's bidding with alacrity because on that he thought his future fortune might depend but he did not make up his mind to ensure success by diligence activity and zeal satisfying himself by saying that the result must ever depend upon circumstances and one of those circumstances was always in this case ned dyram's own good will he had some hesitation however and some fear for there was but one man in england whose displeasure he dreaded and that man was the king but yet i would not imply that it was his power he feared alone he feared offending the man rather than the monarch for henry had acquired over him that influence which can be obtained only by a great and superior mind over one less large and comprehensive it was the majesty of that great prince's intellect of which he stood in awe not the splendour of his throne and perhaps he might have yielded to the impression in the present instance and done all that he ought to have done had he not perceived too clearly the feelings which prompted him to do so for as soon as he was conscious that dread of the king was operating to drive him in a certain direction the dogged perversity of his nature rose up and dragged him to the contrary side he called himself a cowed hound and with all the obstinate vanity of a wrong-headed man he resolved to prove to himself that he had no fear by acting in direct opposition to the dread of which he was conscious as the best way of conquering all scruples he treated them lightly from that moment quickened his horse's pace stopped to sup and sleep about fifteen miles from london and presented himself at the gates of the palace at an early hour next morning there he was kept waiting for some time as the king was at council but at length he was admitted to the monarch's presence and in answer to questions which evidently showed that he had been sent into hampshire to collect information of a more definite character than had previously reached henry's ears in regard to the death of catherine beecham he gave his sovereign at full all the tidings he had gained from dame julian the reeve's wife from brother clement and from two or three other persons whom he had seen before he met with those i have mentioned of brother martin however he said not a word and henry mused for several minutes without observation well he said at length refresh yourself and your horse ned and then go back and join your new lord here is largesse for your service though i am sorry you have been able to gain no more clear intelligence and at the same moment he poured the contents of a small leathern purse which had been lying on the table into his hand the amount was far larger than ned dyram had expected for henry was one of the most open-handed men on earth and he paused looked from the gold to the monarch and seemed about to speak at that moment however the door of the room opened and a young gentleman entered in haste by the stern and somewhat contracted but high forehead by the quick keen eye and by the compressed lips ned dyram instantly recognised prince john of lancaster and at a sign from the king he bowed low and quitted the presence End of chapter fifteen